another Dockside chat with some more friends at SoFar Ocean. Thanks everyone for joining. My name is Nevin DeParlo. I'm our commercial business lead at SoFar. And today we're really excited to dive in uh, below the surface and tell you a little bit more about um, what we're working on with the smart mooring product specifically. Um, so the theme of this webinar is subsurface sensing with SoFar Ocean. Um, at SOFAR, as many of you know, some of you may not, we're a team of about 80 engineers, ocean scientists, and business professionals who are on a mission to connect the world's oceans to power a more sustainable future. And the reason we're on this mission is because there's a massive data gap that exists, both offshore and nearshore in marine environments, largely due to the fact that ocean and marine sensors are, are just not designed for scale. They're typically large, they're expensive, they're difficult to use. And in general, they have high barriers of, of cost and complexity. And we fundamentally are changing that and helping to close this gap with scalable ocean IoT hardware. And in this animation, you're actually looking at hundreds of our spotter buoys deployed in the open ocean around the world uh, that provide data um, to a number of our different products. And for us, everything really starts with accessibility. As I mentioned before, um, the reason this ocean data gap exists is because there are high barriers to entry, both in terms of cost and complexity. And we're changing that at the foundation using our spotter and smart mooring technology and making data more accessible uh, and also user friendly. Of course, here are a couple of our favorite images of spotters and smart moorings being deployed in different parts of the world. Um, and to talk a little bit more about accessibility and to really put this in, in picture for you, as all of you probably know, a typical buoy, um, and specifically marine weather buoy or med ocean buoy, is very large, very expensive. All the way on the left, you see sort of the way we traditionally think of a med ocean buoy, you know, possibly up to three meters, hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, and just not really designed for scale. You need a big ship to go out and deploy it. And we're moving from these few individual high resolution nodes that cost a lot of money and are difficult to operate to many, many, many small nodes in our spotter sensors that can collect abundant amounts of data at far lower cost uh, and much more rapidly. And the same really is true with subsurface sensing. But when we talk about the barriers to entry, it's even higher because collecting data below the surface is really challenging, especially when we're trying to do so in real time or near real time. Um, and so that's the whole focus of this webinar is to talk about how the smart mooring, which you can see on the right, is helping to break down these barriers, especially in coastal waters and for different applications that we're really excited about, and is making these observations far more accessible so that we can build surface to seabed intelligence systems all over the world and enable our customers to collect different types of data. Um, and when we talk a little bit more specifically about the spotter as a platform, and we won't spend too much time here because this is really focusing on the surface. Again, what we unlock is ocean data collection at a fraction of the cost. And I always like to say without sacrificing the value, right? The spotter is a $5,900 buoy. It's the size of a basketball, yes, which makes it very different from a cost perspective, both in terms of the hardware cost and also the operations cost. But at the same time, it's an extremely capable system. The data is really accessible through APIs, dashboards. You can communicate with it easily over cellular or satellite. It's extremely sustainable and, and uh, from a power perspective, being entirely powered by the sun and has low maintenance overhead. But it's also really, really robust, as you'll come to find later in this presentation. We've collected over 10 million ocean hours with spotters all over the world in harsh environments like hurricanes and through winters in uh, the Arctic. And no matter what, they stand the test of time, even when we drop them out of airplanes. And we'll have some fun videos to show you on that in a little bit. So. Yes, the spotter is accessible. Yes, it enables ocean data collection at a fraction of the cost, but it also provides an immense amount of value as well. Um, and when we talk about the smart mooring, everything that we've built with the smart mooring is focused on doing the exact same thing, but below the waterline as well. 
So looking at, you know, the fact that the spotter breaks down those barriers at the surface and can effectively become a power and communications node to the subsurface environment, allowing our users to easily integrate different sensors on the smart mooring or purchase off the shelf solutions from us that allow them to collect data um, on critical parameters that they're interested in without the hassle of system integration um, and really in a package that's easy to use and enables this real-time data collection from the surface to the seabed. And so before we dive into to the next part of this presentation, I'm actually going to pass it off to my colleague, Zach, who is one of our engineers at SOFAR, who's got a, a special deployment uh, highlight that he wants to share. So Zach, go ahead and take it over from here. All right. Can you guys hear me okay? Hey, we've got audio. We've got the right lid this time, so ready to uh, deploy. Thank you guys for bearing with us there. Um, just wanted to show you a couple of things on the smart morning here. So we've got it in on position. You probably can't see it because of the sun, but we've got all of our signal lights on indicating we're ready to deploy. Um, kind of go over this again, but uh, we've got power and data exiting the spotter here out of the smart morning cable. And this is gonna read our sensors that we're gonna toss into the bay here. Um, on a usual deployment, you'd probably be out at sea. So we're gonna do the best to kind of mimic that here in a controlled environment, uh, just so you guys can see what's going on. Earlier, I mentioned some of those uh, sensors. We've got a temperature sensor here and a metal casket. Smart mooring is also a strength member, so you can pull up your anchor uh, or pull the whole unit out using your smart mooring cable. Uh, we like to install in reverse order. So we're gonna go cables first. Your smart morning might look a little bit different than ours. Right now we're running a uh, two node uh, temperature sensor. So we've got a temperature sensor at the surface held up by the surface float, about a meter of polypro line. And then we've got a temperature sensor that you saw me toss in at the bottom. So that's gonna sink all the way down there. So we'll get to see if there's any interesting uh, temperature patterns here in the bay this morning. Hey, that looks pretty good. Non-standard tether, just so I don't have to get my kayak and go get this thing from under the pier. Do a last minute check, make sure my new lid is tight. You can do a star pattern, just like changing a tire. That feels pretty good. So we've had an opportunity to have this guy collecting uh, air temperature data on the dock for a couple of technical difficulties there. So we'll be able to compare that to the subsurface data that you should be able to see in about five minutes. We're running the new cellular modes. So we'll be getting clear, clean data right here in San Francisco in no time. Great, thanks so much, Zach. That was, uh, that was awesome. Cesar, I'm gonna pull up your presentation and uh, everyone watching, we actually have a, another special guest from one of our favorite customers at Aqualink, which uses um, smart moorings in different parts of the world to collect data on coral reefs. So Cesar, without further ado, go ahead. Thank you very much, Nevin. Um, yeah. Hello, my name is Cesar and I come from Aqualink. Aqualink is a philanthropic engineering organization working on building ocean conserv con conservation technology. Uh, and uh, we're uh, we are, have global monitoring of marine ecosystems. And we have purchased over 160 so far smart moorings since 2020. Mm -hmm. And so we are donating these. We'll do it with my father. Oh, <laughs> I think you're on me now. Uh, yep. So we're donating these buoys that we bought uh, to scientists around the world who have applied to receive these for their own research. Uh, Aqualink also have a map and a dashboard and integrates data from sensors, models, satellite observations, surveys, images, and videos 
to give you an instant view of your ecosystem. Alcolink is a free platform and we make all data publicly available. Uh, please change slides. Great. Um, you can connect your smart mooring to our dashboard and compare it with satellite data, upload your own data such as water quality data and perform surveys. There's a bunch of water quality parameters and sensors that we support and we are continuously adding more. We also have surveys uh, on our dashboard where you can collect data and conduct photographic surveys in a structured way based on best practices. You can also create a grid of survey points and upload data and imagery to each point. Um, please switch to the live maps, Nevin. All right, great. So here you have our website and this is a live map on the left. Um, and as you can see, there are different icons, a lot of them. And uh, the Pentagon icons, they kind of popping a little bit. They are actually sites who have smart moorings uh, transmitting live data. And the drop-in icons are sites without a smart mooring and they receive their data from satellites, uh, satellites instead. Uh, in the top right corner of the map, you can also see a layer function where you can change to heat stress and sea surface temperature. Uh, but for now, you can go to that site you selected there in Bermuda and click on explore. Perfect. All right, so this is one of our dashboards and uh, this specific dashboard is an Aqualink user in Bermuda. And you can see the map on the left and to the right is a survey they conducted. And below there are different dashboard cards such as satellites observers observation, buoy observation from their smart mooring and heat stress level. And if you go down just a little, little bit, you see that heat stress graph. Uh, you can actually see that this specific site in August had a bleaching event, or at least the temperature in the water was high enough uh, to become a bleaching event for the corals in this specific reef. And you can see those tiny little circles there in that graph, and that's actually the surveys that they conducted at those specific points. And you can, you can go to this dashboard and other dashboards in your free time and check those surveys. And yeah, if you scroll down, there's more graphs from the data that they have added and was comes included. Um, so yeah, the dashboard is free. Everybody can uh, sign up and create their own dashboard if they are mon monitoring a reef. Um, but yeah, thank you. You can probably switch back to the dash uh, presentation now. Great, all right. This is another one of our Aqualink users, Vantuna Research Group, and they are located in Los Angeles. And they have made some very interesting findings in their restoration reef using their smart mooring. They found a relationship between tidal changes and temperatures in the restoration reef using the buoy and the nearest NOAA tide guide, uh, gauge. Um, figure A displays sea surface and sea floor temperature. Uh, figure B displays the differences between the two temperatures. The color represents the tide height and red is high tide and blue is low tide. And as you can see in the figure, uh, seafloor temperatures tend to spike during low tides and decrease drastically during high tides. Sea surface temperature uh, shows the opposite behavior with a slight temperature decrease during low tides and a slight temperature increase during high tides. This proves that there is a greater temperature difference during high tides. Um, this relationship is also interesting because each tide cycle washes the reef with cool nutrient rich water. And I'll share a link to this when I'm done with this presentation uh, so you can read more about it. Uh, and I, I think that this finding pretty much sums up why the smart mooring is a game changer. 
because uh, the smart monitoring does not only measure the, uh, measure the surface temperature data, but can also help us find out what's going on underneath the surface. Every reef is different and the smart mooring can help us understand it. We at Aqualink use accurate satellite data, but to find out what's really going on underneath the surface and to get the most accurate real-time temperature data, the smart mooring is the best tool that you can get affordably. Uh, we at Aqualink are excited to continue growing our smart mooring fleet with so far. We also think it's valuable to understand other parameters uh, beyond temperature such as turbidity, pH, dissolved oxygen, oxygen, and conductivity, for example. We're excited to see what the future holds for the smart mooring and to see if water quality parameters such as these can be added. Uh, and yeah, you're very welcome to reach out to us at Aqualink and I'll paste my email in the chat later. Thank you. Thanks so much, Cesar. Um, and yeah, we'll we'll save some time for questions at the end, everyone. So you know, you can feel free to drop them in the chat, and um, Cesar might be able to answer some directly even on this call. So thanks so much. Yeah, this is a, an amazing use case. We love working with Aqualink, and um, for now, we'll move on to a few other exciting examples. All right, Isabel and Colin, off to you. Great. Uh, yeah, so I'm Isabel. I'm part of the ocean science team here at SoFar. And I work uh, pretty heavily on this project we call the NOP Hurricane Project. So NOP is the National Oceanographic Partnership Program, largely funded by Office of Naval Research. And we are a contributor to this massive collaborative project that's targeted at um, improving our ability to predict hurricane coastal impacts. So if you go to the next slide, um, I'll give a little more context on the project itself. So it's really about improving our ability to predict the impacts to the coastline. So not just say modeling that hurricane better, but understanding what will happen to those dunes or to the infrastructure along the coastline. And so this is an incredibly challenging project as you can imagine. And in order to try and tackle this, um, it's a collaborative effort across industry. So, so far along with another, uh, a number of other companies, government and academia. So USGS, NOAA, and then a, a number of um, institutions. And so if you go to the, the next slide, um, so far really fits into the picture here in terms of enabling obtaining observations in extreme events. And this is actually a, a two-part effort that involves so far. Um, on the left, this involves smart moorings, which are really emphasized during this webinar. Uh, but I'll also mention very briefly some of the, the spotter use cases, the free drifting spotter use cases. So in terms of the, the smart mooring, we're really trying to obtain observations in the near shore, because if we want to be able to improve our, our modeling of how these extreme events impact the coastlines, we really need to get observations in that, that critical region where things like storm surge and, and wave run up become really complex. And so in this project, um, we're working to deploy smart, smart moorings at about 20 meter water depth, which can be somewhat variable how far offshore that is depending on the location along the coastline. But all of these smart moorings have bottom mounted RBR pressure sensors. So what we actually really care about is, is less what we're observing underwater, but more what the total water column depth is. And as a result, you still have to have that bottom pressure sensor in order to measure the entire water column and estimate um, the, the storm surge while also observing waves. And a really critical aspect of the smart mooring configuration with a spotter is that the spotter has a barometric pressure sensor. And so during extreme events, you're also observing massive changes in um, atmospheric pressure. And so if you really want a high resolution, um, high accuracy observation of water levels and water level variability as an extreme event is underway, that combination of the barometric pressure sensor and the RBR uh, bottom mounted pressure sensor allows us to actually um, observe these water levels in real time. And so that's the, the smart mooring use case. And then on the right, we're also work in this project to deploy in a rapid response fashion, uh, free drifting spotters. And those allow us to get 
um, all of the things that spotters observe, that barometric pressure drop associated with an extreme event like a hurricane, um, increase in wave heights, change in surface temperature, which really is the fuel to the hurricanes, all of these critical variables also important to observe. So if you go to the next slide, I think we can hear from Colin a little bit about the actual boots on the ground, what it looks like to deploy these. Thanks, Isabel. It is a, a straightforward process to deploy this kind of equipment. Uh, as you saw with Zach holding the device, it's lightweight. It's uh, able to be held by only one individual. Uh, the cords and the float are uh, lightweight pieces of gear. And so this really becomes a, an, an easy single person object to handle. Um, on a boat at sea, uh, while one well-prepared person can do this, it works better and goes more smoothly with two people, as you can see in that photograph. Um, the tools needed to attach the floats and, uh, and attach the anchor are, are simple, ordinary hand tools that really any of us would have um, you know, in your kitchen drawer, your garage. Uh, pliers and standard screwdrivers are really all you need. Um, the one piece of gear that's really um, at the customer's discretion to provide is the anchor. And uh, so far can provide some advice on, on the anchors that would work best in a unique circumstance, but those depend on, on factors locally occurring at the deployment site. Um, that's the piece of gear that, that should be handled uh, on the shore ahead of time, as well as uh, configuring the floats and uh, attaching uh, any extra line that would uh, attach a surface float to the device ahead of time. Uh, preparation becomes an important factor, uh, and many of these steps are easily handled on land before loading the gear into the boat. Um, once you're on the boat, as you can see, it's a simple matter of um, getting the device to the edge of the, the boat attaching the anchor, uh, making sure the area is clear and, and knowing the area around the mooring that uh, the device will be dropped into, and then uh, slowly just handling the, uh, the material hand over hand into the water until you finally uh, deploy the, the heavy mooring anchor over the side. Um, preparation again comes into play ahead of time such that you know the mooring area and you're aware of any hazards, any subsurface wrecks, um, warning areas, uh, and then in, the, in the larger space, the, the, the shipping channel and any uh, marine protected areas or other notable uh, marine areas around the mooring site. Uh, the customer is responsible for obtaining any permits that are required. Those involve possibly local permits, but generally a, a state, a Coast Guard, and, and possibly a federal level permit. Those are ordinary permits that are, uh, that are generally straightforward to obtain. Uh, and so far, again, can provide some advice on, on how we do that for our materials. But um, as we said earlier, these are small, lightweight devices that are fairly easy to deploy with two people. So um, we'll give this back to Nevin. Yeah, so what, what does the data actually look like once um, these buoys are out there? Um, and what I'll showcase here is a little bit of data during Hurricane Ian earlier this year. So there was a relatively sparse hurricane season for this project, um, despite Hurricane Ian being a, a relatively catastrophic event for that Florida coastline. And so what's shown here is um, the, the action on the project. And so we are partners with the USGS in this task. And the goal is really to get a cross shore transect. And so the blue dots on the map on the right are the, the USGS deploying their land side observation instruments. So things attached to piers um, and, and cameras and other things like that, really trying to understand as the hurricane makes landfall, the impacts and that, is um, augmented by this 20 meter water depth um, so far spotter or and smart mooring configuration. And so what's shown on the map are, are two kind of general locations. Um, Hurricane Ian was kind of notoriously difficult to predict its landfall location. And so at the time of the, the predictions, um, we really focused having smart moorings in that Florida panhandle area. And then also, um, Dr. Mark Buckley at the USGS happens to have um, one off the, the coast of Tampa. And so I'll actually showcase um, Dr. Buckley's um, data here because it was, it was so interesting in terms of the location of um, Hurricane Ian actually made landfall. But because of the, the ease of deployment, we were able to really have this kind of spread of smart moorings in advance of a storm um, that otherwise would be nearly impossible to get out there. So if you proceed to the, the next slide, I can show some of the, the data 
um, and talk a little bit about why it's so interesting. So um, the, the blue marker is this pier, the landside observations, which are actually plotted in green. Um, and then the, the so far spotter is offshore, once again, um, a USGS smart mooring in this case. And on the upper plot, we see the significant wave height as a function of time um, increases at the peak of the storm and um, slight variability and, and delay with the, the onshore observations of this. And then in the lower plot, that water level. So a combination of the bottom um, pressure and the surface barometric pressure. And what we see both in the smart mooring data and the USGS land side data is this massive set down of the water level associated with these this um, extended time period of offshore winds um, associated with the, the location of Hurricane Ian relative to Tampa Bay. So the winds basically drained Tampa Bay. Um, and we were able to, to collect that um, data with this, this smart mooring, which is really interesting data. And while it really doesn't necessarily show that that massive storm surge, it goes hand in hand with properly modeling this, this storm. And so it will still be really valuable data to um, collaborate with the modelers on this team for them to then assess um, that the accuracy of certain configurations and iterate for the subsequent season as we try to continue to improve our ability to predict um, coastal impacts. Great, thanks so much as well. Um, and Colin, that was really interesting and we're excited to see what you guys do next with Knopf. I will pass it off to Evan at this point who is so far's co-founder and CTO. And he's going to continue on from here. So Evan, take it away. All right. Can you all hear me? I get a thumbs up from uh, thanks, Evan. Uh, hi, everybody. I wanted to do a quick uh, little uh, reference to the the last webinar we did. We we talked about one of the um, longer term efforts that we're working towards, which is being able to deploy systems from any air uh, configuration. So helicopters, planes, any altitude, any horizontal speeds. And we've made a lot of progress towards that in, in the work that Isabel was referring to in, in partnership with uh, NOF and, and other projects. We've deployed dozens of systems from airplanes to different flight parameters. Uh, and we actually have now a, a system that we believe works from any, any aircraft any altitude and any velocity. Uh, it's very simple. I don't know if you all can see the animation that's supposed to be on that slide that, that shows one of the, the drops. It looks like it's not showing up for me. Oh, there it is right on time. Um, so this is out of a, a P3, I believe, uh, with NRL. Uh, what we have is a cardboard foil, real low tech, real affordable. It's degradable. It'll fall away on impact. This will stabilize the descent. Uh, without the need for any parachutes or drogue. Uh, you simply unfold it, wrap it around the spotter unit, it locks onto the handles, there's a strap where you just cinch it down, and then it should be good to go. The reason I'm mentioning this here in the middle of a smart mooring uh, session is that I, we got some questions on this after the last webinar. If anyone has projects or interest in this for next year, we're looking for uh, commercial partners who are interested in being some of the first users of a air deployment system at scale with our systems. So please reach out to us. Thanks, Megan. And then uh, digging into the meat of it, so smart mooring. Uh, as you saw, we deployed a system just in the harbor here, and I want to dig into a little more of the technical details of uh, how the smart mooring is built and what it does. So at, at the core, it is a modular subsurface sensing system. We have this tether, uh, which comes in multiple lengths of sections, so up to 50 meter long sections. It is constructed of a inner conductor bundle core. So this is carrying power and data over a two wire conductor bundle. Uh, we have a Kevlar reinforcement member. Uh, in our testing, we, we test uh, cable candidates to 450 pound lifts over a three inch winch at 250 cycles. 
So uh, real hard work for a cable like this. And so we, we recommend a normal operating load of 300 pounds uh, and, and we don't expect to find any issues staying in roughly those parameters. Uh, so we have all of our mechanical strength. We have electrical power and data in one simple system that's easy to configure. Um, going on uh, to the next slide, please. And how this works is there's a, uh, a part of the system called a termination. So we have our cable uh, entering this overmolded section here. Everything is uh, overmolded, fully overmolded with the same IO fouling and the hardened material. So it's real tough stuff. We've had it in, in the oceans for years without uh, degradation of this core material itself or failures in lamination. Uh, there are a mechanical interface here where we can attach these stainless steel shells. And so you would attach a stainless steel shell uh, to the end here. That transfers all the mechanical load across the section. They use electrical connections in here that you can attach onto. And then inside of these shells, uh, right now there are a couple modular sensors that you can put in. So this is one of our temperature sensors that is in the harbor on that system right now. Uh, we also have a serial adapter uh, that today is programmed to talk to RBR CODA sensors. Uh, there are a lot of marine sensors that use some flavor of these circular uh, submarine connectors, and they all have power and protocol spec for building serial adapters so those can plug into the system. Uh, there's a, a second half of the shell goes on the other side, clamps around the system, uh, tighten down some some hex bolts, and uh, this is good to go. So it protects all the cabling internally and uh, provides a lot of protection to the sensor itself. When you're running something like a RBR pressure sensor, that to live mounted uh, outside or on the line, we have these protective sleeves that can go down over and protect any sensors that are not captured within these metal shells. Let's go to the next one. And then uh, the one of the, the little magic bits in here is the electrical connection. So how do we actually uh, create an electric connection between the end of this cable and uh, a module that, that we're connecting to? And this is where we're using our bristle mouth connector standard. So it is a, an old idea generally. It's essentially a hydraulic face seal fitting designed for high pressure hydraulic systems, uh, but it's applied to marine electrical connectors. Um, the reason that we are moving away from the circular connectors or other connector systems you may be used to seeing in the marine space uh, are a fewfold. One is that this is a much simpler mechanical arrangement. There are no moving parts in this connector system. There's no collet rings. Uh, there's no nuts that need to be clear to be able to thread in. Uh, it's a single threaded interface. And so the way it works is uh, we take our, our plug that's on one of these jumpers. There's a receptacle in this sensor module and it simply threads in. And uh, it's, it's designed so that a firm finger tight will provide the right amount of torque uh, to make sure that we get our reliable seal and that it will not back out. Um, if, if we have applications where we're concerned about some vibrations in the right frequency ranges that might cause these things to loosen on their own, uh, there's a pretty simple system of installing a bailing interlock here just to lock those connectors together and keep them from unthreading. In our sensing systems, we have thousands of sides of connector in systems all over the world in our smart mooring systems and have not had any of them come loose uh, except when you actually want to take them apart, which again, firm finger torque and uh, the connectors off. So there's no moving parts. We have an M4 thread, which is really tough. Uh, if I were more uh, nimble as a person, I could hang from this thing, um, but uh, it's it's got a lot of side load resistance the design is designed for full ocean depth. I want to be clear, we're not rating the connectors to that today. Today, we are testing and rating the connectors uh, to a 
a more conservative um, 100 meter depth. And if you go to the next slide, please know. <clears throat> but uh, we are working towards a full ocean depth rating for these. So internally, we're testing at shelf depths and uh, uh, the design works. Uh, what we need to do to increase the, the rating for others to be able to use this on a stand behind is really on the manufacturing and process control, make sure every single one of these is coming off of the quality needed to go to full ocean depth. Uh, we have a system of internal overmolded O-rings that are assembled under compression and provide a fully water blocked open face seal capability. And so we have a system where we can deliver, you know, uh, tens of watts of power, hundreds of megabits of data, and a robust, simple mechanical interconnect where these are single dollars aside for different improvements. Uh, so we're really excited about it. Uh, we're ocean connector nerds. Not everyone is, but if you're excited about it too, please uh, reach out to us. And uh, we are, are looking for, for, for partnerships. We're looking for applications that'll push the bounds of this technology uh, beyond what we've done with it today. So uh, one more thing that I wanted to mention about the smart mooring system and some of our other new developments, if we go uh, one more slide here. Uh, with the Spotter 3 platform, we now have cellular telemetry capability. Uh, this pairs very nicely with smart mooring system. So on the, the slide here, you'll see an example of data that is over uh, around a week of collection at an ocean beach test site. So a couple miles away from uh, ocean beach in San Francisco. This system actually has four temperature sensors. That's the bottom plot, really interesting tidal and current changes in these temperature profiles. We see these waves of uh, thermoclines. Uh, a lot of the, the estuary and scientists really excited about looking at this type of data. But if we were using satellite transmissions for this, or for the system in this configuration, we'd be paying well over $1,000 a month for this data. That would be the cost of the data to us to send all of this at satellite with low latencies, high time resolution. With the cellular capability, we can send updates at single minutes of latency. Uh, we can send really high time resolution samples. And all of that is included in the default $20 a month pricing for cellular data on Spotter 3. So it unlocks a, a, a whole new usage mode of smart mooring systems to be able to send data much higher time resolution, much higher spatial resolution, much lower latency. So for applications that actually need to have an operational awareness of changing conditions, uh, this, this really changes what we're able to do in the, the data side. Uh, and then one more, let's, thank you. So that's, uh, that's kind of where we are today with smart mooring. Everything I just talked about is in our systems today. They're in the water, we're shipping them. Uh, what's coming up is uh, another big step for our platform technology, also a big step for the smart mooring product. Uh, we are going to be publicly launching V1 of our bristlemouth protocol in uh, Q2 of next year. So June timeframe, uh, this is going to be new technology in our firmware and electrical layers. It's gonna be integration and development kits. It'll be ecosystem components like uh, connectors and uh, sensor mounts, different uh, cast steel elements that can support multiple mooring configurations. Uh, it's a big ecosystem expansion for the, the interconnects and the modular system. The technical capabilities that we're, we're bringing along with that launch is at least five times more data bandwidth on this smart mooring tether. So a uh, minimum of one megabit per second useful bandwidth both ways simultaneously. So you can have two things talking at each other at one megabit per second at the same time, uh, up to 10 megabits per second, depending on the system configuration. That means streaming hydrophone data, streaming camera, if we want to uh, send a very high quality H.264 stream at those data rates. At least three times more power delivery than our existing system. So our existing system 
can deliver three watts into the smart mooring bus. Uh, the new system will be able to deliver 10 watts peak power. Energy consumption, your, your mileage will vary based on where you are in latitude and season in terms of how long you can keep that up. And then there's a new interface uh, protocol, which is a peer-to-peer -peer messaging system where we're using publish subscribe patterns. It's really common in modern web application. It sounds uh, complicated, it's very simple. Uh, so for example, something like the spotter might publish data on its GPS readings. Any other module in the network can easily subscribe to that data and you'll start receiving GPS readings from spotter. Uh, the spotter will subscribe to commands to send a telemetry message over satellites or cellular. Any other module in the network can publish to that uh, topic and tell the spotter, send uh, a telemetry or, or satellite message. And that abstraction layer so that we're publishing to topics, kind of these things are talking in a chat room rather than sending uh, envelopes with the, all the right detailed addresses. It makes the construction and configuration of these systems so much more flexible and, and simple uh, that we're, the goal is to enable ocean application developers to build these systems rather than software engineers. And so we'll go one more slide here. Uh, we're already using this today. This is a perfect example of ocean application engineers building a brand new capability uh, where the firmware and software engineering team provided the tools to be able to flexibly plug in these different kind of Lego-like building blocks. Uh, the image on the right here is actually a, a so far uh, dive diver who is testing a prototype of uh, something we're working on behind the scenes. This is actually a a smart mooring release mechanism. So if, if you need to have a really fast uh, recovery of a deployed smart mooring system, you don't want to pull up the anchor. Uh, there's there's a mechanical module that we have in the in the works to be able to trigger a release over smart mooring. And the team was able to build and prototype this using bristle mouth components very quickly, get it in the water and test it. And uh, we're already doing that. We want all of you who are so inclined uh, to start doing that with us as we move into the Bristlemouth launch next year. So please check out the website, sign up uh, for the mailing list if you're interested. And uh, if you feel like your ambition of what you're hoping to get in the water is a little too high in the sky, then it's probably perfect for us. So don't be shy. Great, thanks, Evan. Really appreciate that. Um, and as we wrap things up before we get into the q and I think this slide just speaks for itself in showing how Spotter and Smart Mooring really unlock um, rapid deployments and instant data access. Um, we might actually be able to cut back to Evan in a minute and he could show possibly some data from the Smart Mooring that Zach deployed, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll give them a minute to determine that. And then in general, you know, you can see that no one in these images is necessarily an ocean data collection expert or a marine scientist. Anyone from a recreational fisherman to a skydiver or uh, you know the Coast Guard could deploy spotters. So that's really what our focus is as a company, not just for the spotter at the surface, but also with the smart mooring below the surface. So Evan, do you wanna show some data or um, should we circle back around to that? Yeah, let's let's search some data real quick. We got it in the water and it's working, so okay, wanna... great. I'll uh, I'll stop my screen share and pass it off to you. All right. All right. Is that uh, working? Yep. Great. Uh, so this is the system that uh, Zach just put in at the harbor here. Here's our location right next to the Bay, Bay Bridge in San Francisco. Um, I'll do a, a refresh. Cool, and we can see that uh, we just received new data from it a minute ago. Uh, we're green light on cellular connectivity, which is great because we have it dialed up to the, the nines in terms of data rates. So see there's a question in the q and I'll go ahead and answer here. Right now you can uh, tune update rates all the way down to five minutes. 
So collecting data for, for five minute intervals and sending that at a, a maximum five minute latency over cellular. So as far as marine applications go, that's about as close to real time as, as you can get. And then if we look at the uh, historical data here, and this uh, system used to live out in the ocean and we've uh, since put it over in San Francisco, uh, now we can actually see uh, just a little bit of data that we've been collecting over the past hour where the smart mooring temperature sensors have uh, gone down to uh, 14 to 15 centigrade, which sounds just about right for the harbor right now. And then we had it out in the, the sun on the dock, we were up closer to, to 20. Uh, of course, we're also getting the the, the wave uh, statistics and, and, and other things alongside these temperature sensors. I'll stop the share. Back to you. Thanks, Evan. Um, yeah, and just to wrap things up, one more slide and then we can open it up to Q&A. Um, to tie things back around to sort of the first slide in our mission as a company, we always like to say that, you know, we live on planet ocean and we, we always want to have an impact. So whether it be from working with Aqualink and having an impact in conservation or projects like the, the not project that Isabel and Colin discussed and the ability to collect data through extreme weather events and potentially improve forecasts, all the way to reducing carbon emissions in the maritime shipping industry industry through pure data-driven insights, this is where you can find us having an impact. And um, we're an ocean-first company and are really excited to talk to lots of you about future opportunities to work together and, and collaborate down the line. So if you do ever have any questions, we can leave this up on the screen. This is my contact information directly, phone number and email, and you can always reach out to us through our website. We're very easy to find. and and always happy to, to chat. So without further ado, I think we can dig right into Q&A. Um, if you could just drop your questions in the actual Q&A chat um, in the Zoom versus unmuting yourself and speaking directly, and I will go ahead and delegate the questions off to, to certain panelists. So it looks like the first question Evan already answered with regard to the communication. Second question is also with regard to the estimated lifetime of the smart mooring. Evan, do you want to take that one? Yeah, so um, it the, the system components will last years. There's nothing that is going to, uh, in a idyllic deployment, there's nothing that is going to degrade um, faster than three to five years. In a moored system in the water though, uh, it really depends on the environment and what uh, the environment grows at the system. So where you are um, in how much energy the system is encountering, peak storm events that might uh, pull up a anchor or toss something into rocks or structure, uh, that, can, that can obviously really shorten the expected life. We do recommend periodic maintenance of these systems to make sure everything is okay. Uh, these cable components are relatively affordable and totally user accessible to uh, replace. So if there's a, a boat strike or um, you know something actually t entangles with the, the, the mooring and damage that we actually had that in Hurricane Ian where a large uh, bit of debris uh, crashed into a smart mooring and the, the customer was able to go out and uh, pick up the, the broken cable and replace it. So we, we do recommend periodic maintenance on the time scale of six months to a year to, to check things and make sure that everything is, is ship shape. Uh, but with regular maintenance, uh, the the expected operational lifespan of one of these systems is, is years. Thanks, Evan. Um, and then a second question, I think this was in reference to the comment on $1,000 per month for sending high frequency data, um, I believe, but Evan, correct me if I'm wrong, that was for theoretically sending data every five minutes over satellite. So correct. You know, tip it, we, we don't enable that uh, rate of update over satellite. That's something that's only possible with cellular. So it's just comparing the cost of cellular, you know, being able to send essentially unlimited data for significantly less cost than satellite. Um, that's, that's correct, Nevin. And, and it is possible, I want to be clear, for 
cellular doesn't work everywhere for the places where uh, you need to rely on satellite. Uh, it is certainly possible to get data out at an acceptable cadence and cost. So for uh, a, a smart warning system with lots of sensors on it, uh, you know, with hourly updates and some longer time scale aggregation, you can get that data cost down to the 50 to $100 a month range. Great. Thanks, Evan. Um, one other question with regard to the accuracy of the buoy systems. Um, it looks like we have a question just directly asking, how accurate are spotter instruments compared to expensive systems or larger buoys? Um, Evan, you, you want to take that as well? Yeah, and that's, uh, I, I think the, the best thing we can do there is point you to third party references who have been testing our buoys alongside larger systems. Um, you know, my biased opinion is that ours are actually better in terms of wave measurements. We get uh, surface tracking and uh, filtering that lets us follow the waves in, in a way that is more representative of what people are trying to measure. Uh, but there, there are several comparative studies at this point comparing our, our wave metrics to those from larger, traditional, more expensive systems. And uh, we do very well in those comparative studies. Um, for other uh, sensors, we, we do have specs on the accuracy of things like our sea surface temperature sensor, which is 0 0.1 degrees centigrade absolute accuracy. Uh, you can pay a lot more for a much higher accuracy sea surface temperature sensor if your application requires that um, and connect that to a smart mooring, for example. You know, the, the RBR temperature sensors are uh, significantly higher absolute accuracy than that. So we'd encourage folks to bring sensors that are needed for a specific use case. And we're really focusing on uh, finding the right level of accuracy that keeps our systems affordable and covers that kind of 80 percent good enough for a broad range of use cases. Yeah, and I would encourage folks to look at our website um, under resources. There should be a section on ocean science and ocean research, and Todd might be able to actually drop that link in the chat. But there's a lot of um, peer reviewed papers there that, that are always helpful to um, take a look at if you're interested in accuracy. For the next question, it looks like we're, we have someone curious on salinity and dissolved oxygen sensors that would be compatible with the smart mooring system. Um, and then second to that, if we order a unit, would these sensors be integrated at the same time? So first off, um, right now, the only off the shelf configurations of the smart mooring have integrated temperature sensors or an integrated pressure sensor or a combination of the two. So we don't offer an off the shelf dissolved oxygen sensor or salinity sensor at this time. Um, in the near future, uh, you will be able to integrate your own. And Evan can speak a little bit more to the requirements there and then maybe allude to what else is coming. Yeah. So um, for dissolved oxygen, uh, there is a sensor that's very close, which is an RBR Coda dissolved oxygen sensor. From a hardware standpoint, it's actually plug and play compatible with our existing uh, adapter module. It'll require firmware uh, to encode uh, the, the driver to talk to that and um, you know the data that wants to be collected from it. That will be possible uh, with the Bristlemouth launch next year. So one of the things that we we get with the protocol is the ability to do a modular firmware update. So it's pretty cool. We did an internal demo of this uh, a few weeks ago. We can have a smart warning system that's connected over cellular, and maybe it has one of these RS-232 serial adapters plugged into it. And over cellular from the internet, we can upload a firmware update to this module and have it uh, able to talk to a new kind of sensor that maybe someone just released. So uh, today, what you can get off the shelf that we will pack up and put in the box for you is the temperature sensors and the RBR coda sensors uh, for, for pressure and temperature. Uh, when we get into the Bristlemouth launch, it will be possible for customers to bring their own sensors and have a clear path to integrating those. Uh, and we'll also uh, be working on expanding the ecosystem of off-the-shelf support. Um, things like hydrophones and multi-parameter SONs, uh, other chemical and water quality sensors on higher in our list, and we'll provide more detail on specific timing of those next year. Um, and, and we also certainly encourage you to reach out with 
you know, the application that, that you want, what the, the dream is for the types of sensors you'd be able to connect to one of these. Great, thanks, Evan. Um, yeah, and just to be clear, as Evan mentioned, you know, we're, we're always working on new products and new integration. So if you ever do have, you know, a strong opportunity that would require a different type of sensor, we'd love to hear from you and happy to, to talk through those opportunities as well. Um, next question is not clear how you install an RBR pressure sensor to the spotter. Could you please elaborate on that? So if you order a smart mooring from us, it would come with the RBR pressure sensor pre-installed and integrated. Um, as Evan mentioned, there is going to be a development kit that's available early next year that would allow you to also integrate your own. Um, but Evan, do you wanna add any more detail there in terms of that installation process or the integration process? Yeah, so um, you know, I think I can make this uh, work with the bits I have here, but uh, so we, we would have uh, one of these these shells uh, connected to the, the smart mooring and a, it mounts to a, a little sensor adapter. So generally we like to keep the physical configurations as compact and close to the mooring as possible. It, it minimizes the exposure for uh, things to run into stuff, structure or um, you know, rocks, things like that. And so the RBR sensors, uh, they, they would mount to the outside of the shell here and uh, very close to the bottom for a depth sensor. So there would be a bottom mount attachment right here. We limit the amount of travel here to minimize any noise induced by mooring motion on the depth measurement. Um, so not super clear, but if you check out the, the website, there's some more detailed diagrams that show exactly what's going on. Awesome, thanks, Evan. Um, one other question on smart mooring servicing and how easy that is. I, I would say before anyone else jumps in here, the smart moorings are designed for ease of use and also for minimal maintenance. So primary concern is going to be keeping the spotters clean from biofouling, uh, as Evan mentioned earlier. And in general, typically, we always recommend self-servicing. If there's a specific technical issue being experienced um, or the spotter needs to be looked at, there, there is always an option where we can diagnose the issue remotely and then also have you send it back uh, if we feel it's necessary. Evan or maybe even Colin, do you, do you have anything to add to that from a servicing standpoint with the smart mooring? No, yeah, I think that's, that's uh, exactly right now. Great. Um, one other question for you, Evan, directly um, about the smart mooring systems. Why was the symmetrical and asymmetrical design chosen for the sensor encasements? And did I see the symmetrical design is anchored to the orange buoy to keep the bilateral nodes horizontal? Uh, I don't quite and follow, follow the, the symmetrical versus asymmetrical part of the question, but for uh, the anchoring to the orange buoy, um, that was, uh, I believe, in reference to what Zach was putting in the water, anchoring to the surface float. Uh, that is uh, simulating a configuration where you actually want a surface temperature. So it's not about necessarily keeping it horizontal. It's about keeping that sensor node close to the surface so it's a proper surface measurement. Great. And the next question I think is good for Isabel, uh, kind of a fun one. What is the largest wave height that you've seen or heard of measured with the spotter? Um, it's a great question. Evan might actually know our records uh, better, but on the order of, I think, 18 meters, and that's significant wave height. So um, statistically significant wave height means if you're in that storm, the largest individual wave could be on the order of two times that. So now we're talking 36 meters, cast that into feet. I think we're approaching about a hundred foot wave um, that our, our little spotters have, have ridden out. And I think kind of the incredible thing, particularly with this hurricane project is seeing over and over again, these buoys go through storms and not once have I seen a, a, a dropout of um, a free drifting spotter during a storm. I think that the greatest failure rate would be it, it 
beaches and then we go out and we try to recover it so it can go out there and catch another big wave. Awesome. Thanks, Isabel. Um, Evan, another good question for, for you on Bristlemouth. Uh, will the new version be backwards compatible with the new or with the current Spotter 3? The, <clears throat> the mechanical connectors are the same. So the, the cabling will be backwards compatible, uh, but the modules will not be. And so uh, if, if you have a existing system, you would need to get new modules uh, that are Bristlemouth compatible, but the cabling components uh, use the identical connector standard. Great, thanks, Evan. Um, interesting question from Kieran on sensor types. Uh, so a lot of the future sensors you listed include parameters commonly collected in situ with handheld devices. Do you think other lab test parameters might be possible, like dissolved metals? Um, I would say there's no limitation on that as long as the mechanical and electrical uh, requirements are met for the smart mooring. Uh, for the most part, Evan, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, we are hoping to enable a platform and an ecosystem where really any sensor can be integrated on the smart mooring. Yeah, I, I think what ends up being one of the hard constraints for moving lab and industrial centers, sensors into marine environments is the uh, deployment longevity. So a lot of these sensors that are doing, um, you know, some, I, I don't know any details about dissolved metals or uh, bacterial sensors, but I expect that there is going to be a relatively short lifespan of the sensor itself. With the smart mooring system in Bristlemouth, the, the path to solving that problem is to make the system so approachable and easy to access that it is uh, palatable to go and replace that sensor head every three months. And it's a cost-effective way of keeping that sensor in the water for a long duration deployment. Great. And sort of following on to that, Kieran also asked this question, mentioned future data rates could support video. Would it be a SOFAR camera system or a connector for existing submersible cameras? Uh, there's always the opportunity that SOFAR could create their own camera system or integrate one off the shelf. But ultimately, you're also going to be able to integrate your own too, just to be clear. And that will be enabled with Bristlemouth. Um, and then one last question, it looks like, um, will there be any possibility to connect custom sensors in the future? Absolutely, just as with the last question, that is what Bristlemouth enables and specifically asking about passive acoustic loggers. Uh, that's actually something that we've had customers that are experimenting with that integration now, even with some custom sensors. So certainly possible and something we will enable. And then lastly, before we wrap it up, and we'll be sure to share this recording out, is there any volume interior to so far for user electronics? So I'm guessing that means inside of the spotter itself. Um, I'll let Evan go ahead and take that one as we wrap things up. There's a lot of space in there. Uh, it is not a intended and designed interface. Uh, I think it is actually something that's pretty interesting with Bristlemouth, it will be possible to build internal payloads that you you could put in there. And it's something we should chat about specifically what you're interested in and how to support that. It's not the first time we've had this request or similar requests to have um, certain subcomponents of the system have an interface where they can be placed on other platforms. And we're very interested in those discussions, not a uh, designed and supported use case today. Great. And then one last question. Um, it looks like how many sets of sensors can be allocated into one single mooring? Right now, uh, we limit it to three sensors and up to 50 meter water depth. But Evan, I don't know if you have any, any future updates there on what we hope to enable as well. Yeah, so for uh, the, the Bristlemouth launch, um, that limitation will be based on the, the mooring itself. So it'll be site specific, it'll be sensor specific, how much buoyancy and, and weight there is. Uh, it will be possible as far as electrical and data connections go uh, to connect tens of individual sensors to a single mooring. But the mechanics of that mooring uh, will be constrained by the specific sites and depth parameters, things like that. 